Good evening and um, welcome back to our broadcast. Um, I pray that you've been blessed through this weekend and that you have been able to enjoy the messages coming from God's word and the encouragement. And we as the female theologians and pastors within the African continent would like to thank you that you tuned in. Thank you that you supported us so far and also that we were able to use God's word to share his blessings with you. Um, thank you for the opportunity. And we do pray and believe that you have enjoyed this time with us um, and that you've been inspired to be brave, to be courageous for God and to stand up through the storms of life and to endure trial and hardship. Before we start, let us close our eyes for a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, you are our strength, you are our guide, and we need you more and more every day. And Lord, as the time approaches and the end approaches and trials and tribulations become more harder to endure, Lord, may you help us to understand, may you help us to be strong, and, and Lord, to have the courage that can only come from you. Bless us now, Lord, as we contemplate your word, is my prayer in your name. Amen. So I'm reading for you out of the book of Jeremiah, chapter 10, verse 23. It reads, Lord, I know that none of us are in charge of our own destiny. None of us have control over our own lives. The title of my talk this evening is Inescapable Tragedy, Self-Imposed Hell or Transcendent Peace. Which one would you choose? So we find ourselves in the middle of a pandemic, um, a worldwide pandemic, COVID-19, and Many of us are feeling stressed out. Uh, many of us have maybe even uttered the words saying that I'm starting to feel a little bit depressed. I'm not feeling so well. Um, I mean, um, what if this thing doesn't clear up? What if things in this world only gets worse? So this type of event that we are currently facing, I would like to term an inescapable tragedy. Um, the verse that we started off with talks about how we don't have control over our own lives. And it, it resonates in my mind the thought that sometimes situations come into our lives that we have no control over. And at that stage, we need to learn to lean on the Lord. But what exactly are these inescapable tragedies? I would like to call them losses, the losses of life, things that come into our lives, things that take things from our lives. And when we go through loss, you know, we, we struggle. And with COVID-19, you might have experienced many losses yourself. Losses like perhaps you have gotten ill, losses of security, um, loss through death perhaps is something that have, has influenced you. The loss of work, the freedom to move around because of lockdown, um, the loss of social interaction, loss of finance perhaps, or that security of will I still have my job at the end of the day, or even perhaps relationships. Um, relationships are being tested at the moment and we, we, we struggle. We struggle to, to know, you know what's going on. Perhaps you are struggling with the loss of routine, you know, having to work from home, having to change everything um, and, you know, find a new reality for yourself. There are so many losses that we are facing with. And when we go through loss, our body reacts by grieving. The feelings of confusion and anxiety that you might be feeling right now is not necessarily depression. It is possibly grief. You see, grief we should not be worried about because it is a completely normal reaction to significant loss. And grief has been described in a variety of ways, but specifically that it is complicated and confusing. It's a time that we don't really know whether we're coming or going. So if everything for you right now is feeling a bit messed up and tangled up and it makes no sense, you are probably struggling with grief. Grief feels a lot like depression and it's almost identical. However, it manifests differently. And its origins are also different. For example, depression is much longer lasting. Grief, however, on the other hand, is usually circumstantial. Things that happen to us, things that are taken from us, causes grief within us. Grief usually doesn't last. Usually when the circumstances clear up or you have grieved and you have gone through the pain, it goes away. Now, I want to speak to you today about grief, not so much about depression. Because it takes a lot of courage for us to face the pain that's associated with grief. Grief is not easy for us to go through. Grief is not easy for us to overcome. So there's basically two major components to grief. They characterize grief as an intense emotional and physical reaction to significant loss. Um, it affects our emotions, our thoughts, our physical bodies, our spiritual lives, and as well as our behaviors. 
Um, something that you might have lost during this time that I'd like to use as an example is the fact that we cannot freely move around for those countries who are affected by, by being on lockdown. Um, social distancing is also a loss that you might be experiencing where you are cut off from your family members, where you are cut off from um, your, your friends and those that are important to you. And, and these might seem insignificant to you, but the truth of the matter is, is that if you're experiencing the effects of it, it's probably because this loss is not as, as insignificant as you think. And what are these, these outcomes that come with grief? Well, we mentioned them already, the emotional, cognitive and spiritual effects of grief. And I'd like to express them to you. Perhaps right now, emotionally, what you are experiencing is anger or feelings of rebellion, saying, you know, this, this lockdown thing, you know, all of these rules that are coming out now, I don't like them. Um, perhaps you're experiencing frustration or irritation or sadness because you can't be with the people that you love. Um, cognitively, you might even start having thoughts of, I'm suffocating, I need to get out of this situation. It, what if it's the end of the world? Um, how am I going to survive if I can't see the people that I love? How am I going to survive if the economy crashes? Um, you might even be experiencing cognitively a lack of concentration, you know, being at home, your environment has changed. Um, there's many distractions um, and you might even in feel a, a decrease in your motivation right now due to the fact that um, your routine is different. So. Not only do we experience emotional and cognitive changes, but our bodies can also experience the, the effects and the symptoms of grief. Um, you might start feeling anxious, and with that anxiety comes the physical things that you might experience. For example, warmth in your stomach, a type of nausea that you experience, headaches because of cause of worry, increased heart rate and heart palpitation, sweaty hands, difficulty sleeping because of the worry, maybe even a loss of appetite or an increase of appetite for that matter. A, a kind of restlessness of I have to do something but I don't know what to do. And then of course spiritually we also are affected by the times of hardship that we find ourselves in sometimes. For some people hardship brings them closer to God. They seek God more and I think COVID-19 has had quite an effect on God's church um, where people have ask themselves, are these the signs of the times? Do we need to come closer towards God? And I think many people have experienced an increase in their spirituality, but there are for some of us the effect where our spirituality is decreasing, where we start questioning God, we doubt him, we, we ask questions of why is this happening, Lord? Um, and we experience spiritual anger because of these, these situations that we find ourselves in, these type of inescapable tragedies that we did not ask for or did we... Or or that we did not cause. And then lastly, there is the behavioral changes that can take place. Behaviorally, we can become less tolerant to the people around us. Um, we might even find ourselves more prone to fights and outbursts and outbreaks because we are so closely confined in our homes with our family members. Um, we might even struggle to, you know, control our emotions with emotional regulation. Some people start isolating themselves because they feel like that is their safe place, while other people become more reckless within the, the situation. Um, situations of recklessness that I have seen that is happening within the social media is people going out and saying, this thing is not so great, and they start licking toilet bowls now. Um, or I've seen some young people posting videos on YouTube where they, f they purposefully drink out of the same water cup to show that, you know, this thing, even though they feel like it's not under their control, they are taking control for themselves and they're doing what they want to do. So, if you are feeling a little bit out of control, emotionally, cognitively, spiritually, physically, and even within your behavior, this can cause a lot of pain. All of these things that I've described so far, the effects of a loss of control really causes pain within us. And within the human heart and within the human mind, there is this urge to gain back control. We are creatures that don't like being out of control. We want to know what's going to happen, how it's going to happen and how things are going to play out. We want to feel less pain and the way that we usually do this is through our behavior. We start acting out. We call this our coping mechanism, um, our behavioral mechanisms. 
And I suppose my question is, is, is that each one of us has a different kind of behavioral change that takes place when we go through these, these inescapable tragedies of life. Some of us tend to watch television more, binge watch Netflix, um, we eat more, we eat less, we get involved in immoral acts, um, we take risks, as mentioned before. And then two things that I'd actually like to speak about a little bit more this evening is how we try to take control of events. Because like I said, grief really creates a, a situation where we feel out of control because it comes on us and we don't ask for it, just out of nowhere. Um, we try to control the events and the circumstances after the events. We try and control people with, that is involved within these um, inescapable tragedies. But I'd like to tell you that um, the only thing that we can control is ourselves. Um, and this realization can cause a, a lot of anger within you if you realize that I can't control people and I can't control events and I am the only one that I can control. But I'd like to tell you that if you think about it, you cannot change things that happen to you, you know, outside events that come in. And if you think about it, have you ever really tried to change yourself? You know, it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, have you ever gone on a diet? Um, how are you doing? Have you, have you managed to stick to the diet? And the answer is probably no, which means that if it's so hard for us to control ourselves, how hard do you think it's going to be for you to try and control other people? You're not going to be able to, and that's going to cause more frustration and more grief within you. Um, so the best thing is, is to realize that you cannot control it and to leave situations and people in God's hands. So, um, if we try and control people and situations, we might end up in what we call self-destructive behavior. Now, you might ask me, what do I mean? You see, we sometimes cause within our lives self-inflicted wounds because we want to gain control and we act out irresponsibly. Because a loss of control, we tend to feel less happy and we try to regain this control by, for example, like I said, we try and control um, these inescapable tragedies and the outcome thereof. We try and control the people within these inescapable tragedies and we end up in a rat's nest of misery. Um, we end up in a self-inflicted hell. Men undertake the job of tinkering up the defective characters of others, only to succeed in making the defects much worse, says Ellen White. Demonstrated through a biblical story, we can look at the story of Abraham and Sarah in the Bible. The Bible tells us that they could not have children, but yet God promised them that they would one day have a son of their own um, that would be there. The Bible tells us in Genesis 15 verse 4 that time passed and no son came for them um, and they could do nothing about it. It was an inescapable tragedy that, that they did not have a son despite the promises of God. And of course, what happens when there's an inescapable tragedy that we cannot control is we try and control it. And this is exactly what Sarah did. Sarah goes to her husband, Abraham, and gives him her slave, Hagar, and says to him, sleep with her and have an heir. And so he did. And um, when Hagar become pre became pregnant, um, the outcome was far worse than that which Sarah expected. Let me explain. You see... Sarah didn't have kids, and that was bad. But when Hagar became pregnant, her situation and her reality became much worse because Sarah still didn't have children. But now, on top of the fact that she didn't have children of her own, chapter 16, verse 4 of Genesis tells us that when Hagar found out that she was pregnant, she became proud and she despised Sarah. So Sarah's relationship with her, her slave becomes negative. And in verse 5, because of this, she goes to Abraham and she tells Abraham, this is your fault that Hagar despises me. And her relationship with her husband becomes soured. Um, and then verse 6 tells us that because of the harsh treatment, the cruel treatment that Sarah did to Hagar, Hagar runs away. And Abraham lands up that his son and the, the lady that bore his son is gone, is missing, hiding. We know how the story ends, and I'm not going to go into it. But basically, the end of the story is, is that two rival nations, um, two rival nations, come out of 
this urge to want to control situations. They end up in a self-inflicted hell. Sarah and Abraham and the rest of the world end up in a self-inflicted hell. And today we sit with the Arabs, or as we know them, the Muslims and the Jewish people, who are supposed to be a family that gets along, but instead they are constantly at war. If you go to Jerusalem, you will see that there are certain parts of the of this city that is inhabited and, 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 and by the Jews and other parts inhabited by the Muslims, and they don't mix, they don't intertwine. The one is not allowed to go into the area of the other. Inescapable tragedy when we try to control it, when we can try to control the people and the actions and the outcomes thereof, leaves us in a, in a self-inflicted hell. Most of us don't realize that in our lives, much misery and hellish events is self-inflicted. We don't reason from cause to effect. We need to learn to ask ourselves, is my actions going to bring about that which I am trying to achieve? Um, so if you feel anxious about an inescapable tragedy, maybe it's COVID-19 related, maybe it's something else within your life that is happening at the moment, don't try and regain control um, by, by doing things that are not good. Let me give you an example. If you are an emotional eater and a situation arises where you feel bad, don't run to that because you're not going to feel better if you go and you eat a lot of junk because probably what's going to happen is you're going to end up gaining weight, you're going to end up feeling more depressed and you're going to end up in a self-inflicted hell where you were already in a bad situation, you're going to be in a far more terrible situation in the end. An inescapable tragedy added a self-inflicted hell. So, we need to learn to stop and think, to reason, where is this my actions going to take me? Are the results going to be favorable? You see, we often think that we know best. We think we know how life is going to turn out. But we forget to take God into consideration. We forget to lay our plans before him. We forget that you know, we are not as self-sufficient as we imagine ourselves to be. Proverbs 14 verse 12 tells us that there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is death. A self-confident person who is determined to have his own way and to advocate his own ideas will go from bad to worse. We need to be careful in trying to fix things ourselves and try and change the outcomes. Proverbs 3 verse 5 to 6 tells us that. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. This is a willing surrender of control. And lean not on your own understanding. In other words, the Bible is telling us, don't think you know how to fix this. Don't just assume that certain actions that you are going to enter into is going to make you feel better or change the situation. Stop trying to take control of situations. A rat's nest of misery is awaiting us if we do this. You see, life does bring in, at times, inescapable misery. That's out of our control. But we make it worse by adding self-imposed misery. The one is a tragedy, the other one is hell. The one is bad, the other one is worse. You can, for example, be at your father's deathbed. And this is a tragedy. Or you could be at your father's deathbed and fighting about what he has left you in his will and testament. This is hell. Do not add hell to your already tragedy. It's true that tragic circumstances can bring out the dragons within us. Stress is high and all things that people haven't dealt with during the time of loss will probably come up because we don't have the energy to repress it anymore. All the bitterness will just come streaming out. I've seen this happen, and it is an ugly, ugly situation that arises, sometimes even a murderously ugly situation. There are families, however, who have learned that even though terrible things happen to us, that we can pull together, that we can be each other's strength by going to God and laying our plans and our worries and our concerns at His feet. God needs to be our refuge. We need to go to him and say, Lord, help me, help our plans, help us that we will not make the situation worse than what it already is. 
So where are you currently in COVID-19? Where are you currently in the journey of your life in terms of things? Are you pulling together when you are facing um, inescapable tragedy? Or are you busy creating a self-imposed hell? Don't make this time harder than it already is. Don't make your already difficult situation harder to endure. Don't allow your thinking and your acting and your emotions to run wild with you. Your words can make the situation worse. Watch them. Place a guard around your mouth, as Proverbs says. Um, Your deeds can make things worse. Think before you act. Don't try and control the outcome. Leave it in God's hands. Don't try and control people. Rather work on yourself. So there is this saying that says um, in Matthew 7 verse 3, Why then do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the log in your own? How dare you say to your brother, please let me take the speck out of your eye when you have a log in your own? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will be able to see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. We think we can control Um, We can gain control back and feel calmer and less anxious by controlling people. But the Bible says, no, work on yourself. Um, There is a remedy to this self-inflicted hell and inescapable tragedy. We can avoid the the self-inflicted hell and we can cope better with the inescapable tragedy um, if we follow the example that the Bible gives us. And this... Um, advice that the Bible comes, gives comes out of the book of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. It says, don't worry about anything, but in all things, through prayer and through supplication, make your request known to God, um, thanking him that he will answer. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts, that's your emotions, those that are running wild, and your mind, that's your thoughts, the ones that you can't control, safe in Christ Jesus. I call this psychology in the Bible. The Bible is saying that if you are struggling to know what to do, because you're probably going to end up in hell, you're probably going to end up in this inescapable self-inflicted hell. Um, If you are not sure what to do, take it to the Lord. And the Bible says we need to pray and he will give us peace. So now let me ask you, perhaps you're thinking today, but I have been praying. In all the situations of life, I have been praying and yet nothing. My question to you is, have you really prayed? I'm not talking about that charismatic prayer where you stand on the street corners and shout out God's name to everybody to hear. And I'm also not talking about using big fancy words and praying long prayers. No, really praying, like opening up the heart to God as you would a friend. Opening up your emotions, your feelings, your bad thoughts, your good thoughts, your wants, your desires, um, your struggles, your questions, everything that you would normally ask a friend, ask it to God. If you're angry, tell him. If you're sad, tell him. If you're happy, tell him as well. So, have you opened up your heart to God as a friend? Now, let me ask you, how do you speak to your friends? Do you speak to your friends like this? Dear Sarah, today was hard, but I know that you are my friend, and that because you are my friend, everything is going to be okay. But please, will you help me when I go through these hard times? Okay, thanks for listening. Goodbye. I'll see you a little bit later. No, none of us speak to our friends like this. When we speak to our friends, we dig really deep. We go into detail. We, we pull our faces. We, we, we might even, you know, hit something. Uh, we, we, we give our emotions. We show our emotions completely. And my question is, do we do that with God when we pray? We should learn to pray, to really pray like Samuel's mother. When she went into the temple to pray in Samuel chapter 1 verse 13 for a child, it says that her prayer was so intense, so heart-wrenching, so confusing that Eli thought she was drunk. Have you ever prayed so intensely that it looked as if you were drunk, poured out your heart to God, body, mind and soul, telling him everything, laying your cares and sorrows on the altar of sacrifice? I wonder how she felt after she prayed that prayer. If you've ever prayed a prayer like that, 
you would know that after you have really laid your heart bare to God, you get up and you feel you feel ready to face the day again. You see, your situation might not change. God might not answer your prayer in the way that you might imagine that he will. But the Bible promises that God is going to give us a peace that surpasses all understanding. And when this peace comes, you might say, but I don't understand. I feel calmer. I feel like I can cope with this, even though the situation hasn't changed. This is the promise that God gives us. Not only does he promise to give us peace, a transcendent peace that doesn't make sense, but he says he will guard our hearts and he will guard our minds. In other words, he will help us not to think things and say things and feel things that are going to get us into trouble, that that is going to allow us to impose a self-inflicted hell on ourselves. So my thought to you today is this. Do not sabotage your own happiness. Don't turn tragedy into hell. If you don't know what to do or how to act or how to feel, if you're struggling to reason from cause to effect, if you lack wisdom, go to the Lord. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach. It will then be given to him. Take these tragedies, your desires and your wants, your inescapable tragedies to God in prayer. Avoid adding a self-inflicted hell by letting your emotions and mind run wild and allow God to give you a transcendent peace that surpasses all understanding. May God in this coming week be your peace. Amen.